This is Tanya Lin with the Sistership Circle podcast. From spirituality, sexuality, and sisterhood to business, relationships, contribution, and creativity, the Sistership Circle podcast introduces a new model of feminine leadership where women get real and vulnerable about it all. Tune in for authentic advice that will empower you to be bold, beautiful, and brilliant as your true self. Hello, Hi. really excited for this call today. Um, oh, this is, this is going to be a really good one. And so I don't want to take any more time. Um, I just want to dive right into who we are speaking with today. And that is um, Leah Dunlap. So if you have not heard about this incredible woman, she is the Oracle on purpose. And she has over 20 years of experience as an intuitive business architect. She's helped intuitive entrepreneurs and inspired leaders find and follow their unique life purpose. Her divinely sourced products and result driven services have helped thousands of clients in over 76 countries align their purpose with their business strategy to create a powerhouse business that makes money while making a difference in the world. Her wit, wisdom, and down to earth nature help clients feel instantly at ease as they shed old paradigms and embrace new possible new realms of possibility. I feel like I can't read today, but that's okay. <laughs> She's a master creator, best-selling author, international retreat leader, and the founder of the Master Creators Academy, a self-directed online life coaching program that helps people create a foundation of success using fundamental tools for living your unique life purpose. So welcome, Leah. I'm really excited for us to dive in today. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing to really help propel people forward into sisterhood and into society of learning and growing and really supporting each other in our unique gifts. Because honestly, um, you know, that's been my passion for my whole life is to really spotlight what's unique about an individual and what they're here to bring to the world. So I really appreciate what you're doing and how you've uh, created this space to really bring people in to talk about that. Mm, thank, you. thank you. Yeah. And that is where I really would love for us to go today is, you know, that, that piece of like, what, what is, what is our uniqueness? And I, I feel like that can be the theme. And one piece that, um, that I'd love for us to start with, uh, that we talked about before we actually hit record here is, um, you know, so many of the women who are in our community listening are intuitive their empaths um and they it's like when do you turn that on and and how do you navigate that and as an oracle you're the oracle on purpose and so um and we can even clarify like what exactly that means to be an oracle but you know it's like you have information coming to you about someone and that it's like, how do you then navigate that? And when do you turn it on? And when do you turn it off? And, um, and what are the boundaries around that? And uh, I'd love for us to start there. So what is an oracle? And how do you navigate that of when to um, bring your gifts into a conversation? And, and how do you structure that? Right. So the, the, the technical definition of an oracle is someone who's, who shares a message. I mean, really, that's kind of the fundamental core of it. Um, how each of us, and I know myself, I know many empaths, psychics, oracles, um, we all have our own um, inner connection to that source. Mm -hmm. And so it comes out, I think, specific to the person, to the human who it's going through. So for me, um, I actually have the capacity to see and receive not only verbal messages, so I hear, I'm auditory, but I also get visual cues for my clients. So I always talk about, it's like for me when I work with someone, it's like I'm stepping onto the holodeck. So if any Star Trek fans will know what I'm talking about, it's like pictures literally show up in front of me in different spaces in my, in my what I call my theater. And I know whether it's something that's happening now, something that's happening in the past, the future. And, um, and because I'm open to it, I, I will often get guests, guides, and family members showing up to share knowledge, just sometimes to say hello and send love and support. So um, I tap into all of those tools because 
Um, there are people now currently who have gone to be trained to do this work. In other words, they've gone to other um, gifted people and learned how to tap into their own intuition and to utilize that. I'm a little unique. I was born this way. I have never not had this gift. And I had to train myself at 14 how to use it and what it was for and what it was about. And that was not always pretty. Um, so I've had a lot of time to decide and decipher and figure out how I get to live in my own human body and communicate with this Im immense entity and provide what I'm here to provide, which is her messages for these people that I work with. Um, when I was younger, uh, there was a lot of people that there were people in my group when I came around like my school kids and 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 even employers who knew my gift and would just ask me questions and I just felt I mean it was just fun so I would just answer but there was a time when I started to become older where it felt as if I was as I was saying to you before kind of like a sideshow uh, trick and I didn't like that feeling and I didn't want to be perceived that way. And I didn't want what I knew to be such a valuable tool and gift to be used cheaply. And so I actually went completely the opposite direction when I got out of school and I went into psychology and I went into the corporate world and I tried to get away from this. But the, the challenge was, of course, as I tell people, I am the Oracle on purpose everywhere I go, the Oracle goes with me. Everything I do, the Oracle sees and knows and does with me. So it wasn't like I really could get away from it. And so it would leak out. And I would feel like I would do what I call, what I joke about now when I'm around a group of people, is blurt. I would blurt things because it would just well up and I couldn't not say something to someone. So I had to learn myself how to manage that. And when I recognized that if I gave um, if I created a container for that information and a way for it to be revealed, then a couple of things happen. One, I was less literally, and I'm sorry to say this, but less crazy. I felt less divided and confused myself. And then the information that I was, was sharing was clearer and cleaner and it came through more smoothly. So there was an ease of, um, transformation and also transmission that happened when I said, okay, I'm sitting down, I'm here to do this work. This person and I have agreed to do this work and we can go now. And then the conversation became really clean and clear. And so it took a while for me to do that on my own. But, you know, as you mentioned, I've been doing this, I've been working as a coach um, since 1994. And I have always used my gift. And so I used to kind of weave it into what I was doing and now I've brought it forward. And now that I brought it forward, what I found is that I can hold that container uh, more purposefully, hence the Oracle on purpose. And the clients I get have better results because they know when they step into that container that they can be relaxed, they can be open, and they can have that flow of communication that they need. Because ultimately, my goal is really to help them figure out what their secret sauce is, what, they, what their best next move is, and why they're getting certain information, which is why what I do is a little bit different in that I do focus on people that are working on businesses or leadership who want to have a better impact on the world. And therefore they want to make sure that they're doing things that are aligned with who they're here to be. And that's my, that's my secret sauce is like, I can see literally I get a picture that unfolds in front of me that looks like one of those cell maps that shows you like all the roads and paths and I see which ones are light up and which ones are not and so if they're heading a direction they ask a question I can say that's not the direction that's probably best for you right now and tell me more and there's like a more of a communication and a conversation for me and that's how I do it I know that other people literally just have physical sense and so the empaths that I know They'll just feel and sense that something's not right and they'll ask the questions to kind of guide someone through the process. So it's a little different for everybody. But that's pretty much how I've, I've grown to create a space that is, um, you know, to me it's, it's, 
it's a bit of a sacrament. It's like, this is the place where we're going to do work now. Um, that's not to say when I get into groups of people that are also in paths, that if we're having lunch or something, I just ask, honestly, I just ask at the very beginning, do I have permission to blurt? Because then it's easier for me, like, because when you get around people that have a lot of energy, it's, it's pretty much a pressure. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, it feels like pressure. So, um, you know, I think it's just about asking permission and being really clear. Mm, yeah. I love that. Oh my God. There's so much, so much, so much that you've said. This is so good. So um, what I'm most present to right now is that there are so many women who are listening to this who um, have been born with a gift or have a gift from when they were little. And it kind of makes them a little bit of a freak, right? The, the intuitive, empathic, psychic women um, who then had to learn how to shut that down because it wasn't accepted, right? Because our, our society doesn't really accept that. Um, so if you're, if you're listening to this, you can like be raising your hand. Yes, I'm speaking to you. Yes. Um, and that, you know, you've, you've come, so it's like push that away and then realize, okay, it, you can't. It's who you are coming back into alignment with the truth of who you are and now embracing that and stepping into how do I take my, this, my dharma, my gift, and my, the, who I am and form that into um, my purpose, like my, the work that I do in the world. Yeah. And I would say every single woman who's listening to this is, is like figuring that out, right? Or is already there. Um, and so I'd love to like go deeper into some of these pieces here um, of, yeah, there's just so much. So um, the one where I really want to start is you were saying when you were 14 and you had to figure, like there's something you had to figure out um, and there were some things that perhaps uh, happened, some challenges that you were faced with. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that um, of what, and you know, that's the hardest part is preteens, teens, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I think it it's, not, yeah, it's not an accident that it happened at that point, honestly. And I, I look at okay. that, I know that now, obviously. Yeah. Um, so my family very much not woo, like, so very clearly, um, with the exception, I will say of my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that's why I was very close to my grandmother growing up. Um, and so I, I'm grateful every day that she was in my life because I'm adopted. So my family, it's not my family of origin, but my grandmother, who I think now was as well intuitive to some degree, um, and, and she could see that in me, I think she gave me a space to, to have conversations that were different, have, you know, experiences that were different and, and just recognize them. I don't, we never really talked about it, but it was just a place where I could say the things I saw or, or heard or felt. And she would just accept that that was real for me. Um, so she gave me a little bit, I think at the very beginning of my life of just being heard, which was so vital. Um, and whereas mm -hmm. my, my actual core family, my parents, when I would have these experiences and I would tell them, um, oftentimes at night, because it was quiet and that's kind of when things happen, um, I would be told that I was having nightmares or dreams, just go back to bed, you know. But when I was 14, I saw my first full body apparition in my room. And I was old enough and awake enough to know this was not something I was dreaming at the time. And then I recognized like in a flash, oh, this is what's been going on all these years. And I never had the chance early on to have that conversation. But because I had already gone like off to school and I was a teenager, I could do my own research, right? I could already start to kind of tap into, well, if that's what's happening, what is that about? And so I did, I just started like reading more and finding books on, on metaphysics. And, and so, and, and I think, you know, I started going to different churches. I went to like Every kid that was in my school, I said, do you go to church? I want to go to your church. I'm like, I went to a Catholic church. I went to a Jewish community center. I went to Methodist church. I went, I'm like, tell, I was just so hungry mm -hmm. to understand what this, this connection was, um, that I wanted to just figure out where do I belong, right? Where do I belong? Um, it didn't really work. 
frankly. I ended up at a um, at um, a center for spiritual living, which was kind of the closest thing that could make me at least feel um, like I have conversations about, you know, I yeah. see things, I hear things, etc. Yeah, you're not a freak. Yeah, exactly. Like it was like it was it was okay to be there and be me. And that helped a lot, honestly. I think community, and that's why what you're doing is so important, you know, community where you can be yourself, whatever that looks like, is so vital, especially to young teenagers who are experiencing these, um, you know, awakenings, if you will, that um, that helped me a lot. And then, as I said, because I started to know that these things that I was experiencing was real, I just, um, I started paying more attention to when they were happening and why they were happening. So um, when I was in school, like I had a friend who asked me a question. It was a very important question. She found out because her, her brother and her got in a fight that she was adopted. And she was almost 17 and he was mad. So he decided that was the way he was gonna solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And she was so upset that nobody had ever told her and she wow. felt completely broken and, and lost. And she came to me um, and we worked it out and we talked about it and we talked about what she could do. And, and, you know, I knew that from the senses I was getting that her parents felt like it was the best thing for her because they did look so much alike that they figured it would just make her world and her life better, never to know. And they were never planning on telling her. And so, um, you know, we worked through that <laughs> I mean, I was, I was in school and lunch break and we were sitting and we we're having this entire session about how to take care of that and what she could do about it and how she could release some of the anger and the frustration and the pain and the hurt. And then she sent friends to me and then other people heard about it and sent friends to me. And I spent my entire high school years in my lunch breaks helping clients who weren't paying me with every possible version, you know, of teenage angst you could imagine. And that was my training ground for what I do. And then I had um, a boss, because my first job was at McDonald's. Yay, corporate world. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my boss took me aside, and this was back in the like 80s, so things were not like they are today, and started having this entire conversation with me about her, um, her partner, a female partner, and how they were gonna, they were thinking about getting divorced and all, like she, like we're cleaning the fryer and she's having this deep conversation with me. And she's like, I don't know why I'm telling you all of this. I'm like, I do, because I have these answers for you. I don't know why at the time, but I did. And yeah. so, you know, that just, that's where I knew that I, my differentness was on purpose. Like I was different and it was still hard. It was still a challenge um outside of that wall right so outside of the the where i used to work in the in the drama room practice areas when i went into the quad for example i would become just one of the kids right but people would send people to me like it was like this weird underground tunnel thing where they'd send somebody into the practice rooms and they'd find me and we'd sit and we'd do this work and then i would go out and just be one of the other kids at the school, high school nobody like in general knew, it kind of was word of mouth that, that you could talk to me and I would help you answer these really big, intense questions you were having. So it was always at that time, this juggling of being in myself, knowing that there was a reason this was happening. Like I really did feel that. And I feel like when I talk to people that are starting to come to their awareness, that they have a sense inside of them. And if you're listening to this and that's you, it, it follow that because there is a sense in them that there's a reason they're getting this these signals there's something about it that they understand from a different point that is on purpose and that's to me what helped and unfortunately because I didn't have a big support group outside of that I just hit it until I felt like it was safe to be fully present in it so there was always for a long time this kind of dance that I did. And I think that even though I did the dance, I knew someday I'd be here. Like someday it would be okay and I could just be who I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I'm wondering when 
Okay, so let's go now forward to when you, you've been working with these clients for free and now you're ready to monetize this or step into creating a business out of this. And I think this is so many women get stuck is, oh my God, this is like, I have to come out. I have to become visible. Like this part of me needs to come out into the world. And then, oh my God, I have to, I'm, I want to charge for this. I'm going to get paid for this thing. That's been like this thing that I've wanted to hide half my life. Right. So can we go back to the early days of you forming a business and right. what you um, had to overcome? What are some of the challenges that you had to overcome and how did you actually create a successful business where you've been impacting people from all over the world? Right. So I think that the, the first piece um, was, yeah, it, it definitely was about getting, getting um, enough support behind me that I felt like if I failed, which I don't tell, technically believe in, but if I failed, yeah. that the people that knew me best would know that I was still, and here's a thing, I think that word that's going to probably resonate with people, that I, that I was still was a legitimate psychic. Like this was not, if, if this business falls apart, it's not because I don't have a gift. It's not because this isn't real. It's because I screwed up, <laughs> frankly, like there's business. And I think being in the corporate world for the first, you know, 15 years as well. Like I would go off and I would do, I would do retreats and I would do, I would work with clients on the weekend and evening. And then again, I, so I kept it separate for a long time, but because I had my own experience in the corporate world and in business, I knew what it took to run a business. And so I knew that if I failed, it wasn't because what I have to offer isn't real. It's because I didn't follow the business basics. And that I think is part of it. Like, that's why I'm so passionate. Like, yes, you have a, you have a passion or you have a purpose or you have a gift. And there are still some business strategies that everybody has to follow to have a successful business. The challenge is not feeling like if you don't make the right moves, it's, it's some sort of um, cancellation of your value as an intuitive, because it's just not. Um, and so I, I like to think that when I finally like drew the line in the sand and said, okay, I'm, so I, I kind of cheated to be very honest. Okay. I'm going to keep it real. Um, I started, so I went off to go to psychiatry. I was going to be a psychologist because I, because I was, that's kind of what I figured, like you said, how do you monetize this? Right. So when I got out of school, I'm like, well, this is what I do. So maybe I'm a psychologist until so I went to psychology school and found out this is not what I do at all. And I was like, oh, this isn't gonna work. And so then I went and I found hypnotherapy. And the beauty of hypnotherapy was, A, I was totally comfortable there. B, I could actually sneak in all of the, all of the messages from the Oracle into someone while they were under hypnosis and nobody has to talk about it. Nobody has to know. We're just gonna do it. So for years, that's what I did. And, they were happy, they got results. I was happy, I got to share the messages. Everybody was fine until it wasn't anymore. Until it was like, okay, that's just kind of ridiculous at this point. Um, and so I finally you know, had spent so many years helping people be authentic, helping them be real, helping them find their purpose, helping them live their purpose and work. And it was like the tap on the shoulder, like, okay, now let's, come on, let's do this. So when I decided to come out um, and really put the oracle forward, what I recognized was there, like I said, there was just still some business fundamentals that had to happen. You know, there's branding, there's the way you're presenting, there's positioning. And most of that comes from the confidence to know that what you have to offer is valuable and that people who really need your help will find you if you're confident enough to show up a hundred percent. So to me, that was the that was the turning point when I just switched all of my branding and really pushed myself out in front um, as the oracle. Then I could create. Um, sorry, this is the oracle jumping in here to have a conversation with me. My apologies. So <laughs> if I stop like that, just like wait, you didn't tell them this. Yes. So the 
the big pull became something that I was so afraid of, right? So all these years, I thought I would push people away by telling them about my gift. And really, the exact opposite thing happened. When I said this is what I was doing, my existing clients, this was the beautiful part, they're like, oh, now it makes sense. Like, they didn't run away. I mean, some of them did, to be fair, right? Some of them are like, that's not for me, and that's okay. But the majority of them, they were, like, on board. In fact, they were like, oh, now it makes much more sense. Like, wh how you could know or why you asked that weird question last week when it had nothing to do with what we were talking about, right? So then I knew, and I think this is, like, that confidence. I had to have the confidence first to step out there. But the world really will show up for you. The universe is waiting for you to be yourself. It always is. So once you get there, then you get the recognition, but you don't get it first. And that's the tricky part. You have to take that leap of faith. And once you do, the universe rises up to meet you. And that's really what happened. Yeah. And I think that's an important piece that you said at the end around, um, you know, yeah, some people, some of the clients are like, no, this isn't for me. But along with you and that when you do come into your truth, there's people who you're going to repel away and, and, but you're going to actually step into more of attracting who you are supposed to serve. And I see this happen a lot of, you know, we're so afraid of getting rejected or upsetting someone or, you know, and especially with circles, I've, I've struggled with this of, you know, sometimes speaking my truth, um, then not everyone's going to like me. And that's why I create circles, right. Is to create community, create a sense of belonging for myself and others. So it's like every time that I come up against, oh no, I might, you know, someone might leave. There's that piece within me that um, gets uh, triggered or, or shies back, but it's to remind ourselves that it's okay if those people leave, it's just creating right. more space for those who are really desiring us and really need us. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it, you know, I, I like to say to my clients, if you're going to leave a job or position, if you're so miserable with what you're doing right now that you're not happy, you're because this helps, especially with women, I think, just know you're standing in somebody else's spot. And then they're like, oh, because your spot's over there and you're standing in someone else's spot. And once you move, they get to be where they're going to shine and you get to be where you're going to shine. So it's yeah. not a idea that you have to feel like there's a loss. There's just a shift. And the energy you're waiting for here is never going to show up until you're in your spot. And when you are, then you get the energy you deserve to get from the universe. And the, that person who's been waiting for you to step out of that, that cramped room you're in, for them, that's their shot too. So I think that as women, we kind of tend to resonate with that idea that we're so giving that it kind of jars people out of like that whole like, clinging to something that they already have for fear that they're going to lose something and it's like what if what if you could entertain the idea that what you're going to do is give yourself something and give someone else the opportunity to and I feel like that shifts oftentimes help pe helps people to recognize that we really do have a unique purpose and if we're doing it then we then we are in a growth pattern and if we are not in a growth pattern and that's when we can kind of just take a moment to look at it and say, is it because I'm, I'm in that box that I really don't belong in anymore? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a point to consider too for people that are, are holding back because of that fear that there's so much more possible. Sometimes that's a little scary. Um, but none of us are here by accident. So someone's waiting for you to show up in your spot. Like, think about that. You know, someone is waiting for you to be there so they can get the help that you're going to give them. And if you don't show up, then they're missing out too. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I would even relate this to if you're in a relationship that you're just unhappy with and, and you're not married and you want to get married, like, you got to get out of that relationship so that you can meet your <laughs> soulmate. You can meet your husband or your partner, you know? So it's the same thing, you know? Like, we got to clear out that space to then have what's really aligned um come in so yeah 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 ah i do want to ask a personal question 
All right. Um, I want to ask about being adopted. I have a fascination, fascination with this. And then you sharing about, you know, helping another woman who um, was struggling, you know, went through that. And it's funny because um, my husband found out uh, the same way um, his aunt told him that that wasn't his real father. Yeah. At 13. And um, it, was, it was a really devastating moment. Um, you know, it, it, he, he, he never met his birth father. And just recently, we actually went to look for his birth father. Wow. Um, and so I'm just curious as to how that impacted you. Um, did your parents tell you at an early age? Um, did you ever find out who your birth parents were? Yeah. So um, it's pretty easy for me. My entire family is white. I am not. Um, so it's pretty obvious from get-go. I was also adopted at two months old. I have a, um, there's five siblings in my family. So I'm adopted. And one of my older brothers is adopted. He was adopted when he was seven and a half years old. Um, and so, um, yeah, adoption, it was never, it, it was all, it was always very obvious that I was adopted and we adopted another child. So adoption was pretty open. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, what, one of the things that, um, I worked through with the woman, um, from high school who found out she was adopted was something that I actually ended up going and helping with in California. There's an adoption agency where I lived and I actually went to help with them and speak to them for people that were choosing to adopt and talk about adoption because I was so passionate about it because wow. what happened was in, in my family and my experience, even though I knew I always still felt other. And yes. what happened for her and one of the state, and this is how it ended up happening that I went to work with these adoption agencies was because when she told me, when she found out what was weird was she always felt different, but she could never put her finger on it. And it was sad because I knew why, like I could look around because I don't, I don't, I don't have your genes. I don't have your blood. I don't think or hear or speak the way you think or hear or speak. And I'm fitting into this family. And so I always knew that there was something off about that. And I understood where it came from. For her, she didn't understand. Yeah. And so she just felt like there was something wrong with her. Yeah. So for 17 years of her life, that's literally the world she was living in. And so we, weren't, we processed through a lot of that. And when I went to talk to adopted families, I said, please understand this. I am saying this with all the love in the universe, but this child you adopt, is not your birth child. They will never be your birth child. And as much as you want or love or care for them, there is another piece of them somewhere else. Mm. And, and there's a sense in them that that's the case. So I was a very firm um, proponent for open adoption. And, and I would say, it's not, going to, it's not going to fix it but it is going to make it possible for you to have a conversation. And if you don't tell the child and they go around their whole life thinking something is off, that's a, that's a itch they can't ever scratch because they don't even understand where it's coming from. And it could, you know, leak out in all kinds of crazy ways that, and that's kind of where she was. She was always very anxious. And so, so there was a blessing and a curse, obviously in that reveal. Um, and, she became more confident in herself. And now all those things that she was feeling made sense. So then she made sense so that she could go forward and go like, Oh, okay, this explains why. And therefore that could be put to rest. And mm -hmm. so my point was to them, Hey, look, if you tell your kid they're adopted and you chose them, you, you know, you have the conversation and you're just honest, then then when they are ready and if they're curious and if you can get, and so I was tell, I would tell them, here are things I always wanted to know. I wanted to know what they look like, my parents. I wanted to know what they did, you know, and what things I have that might be like them, right? Like where those things came from. And honestly, I never went to look for my parents. My mother is actually Irish. She's from Ireland and she was on a visa when she got here and left and left me. So wow. I've never sought her out. I've thought about it for years. The weird part of this is, and I think it's just, it possibly might be because I'm a woman. Like I always wanted to find my mom 
also I don't have a really great relationship with my mother. So I think that's part of it. Like I have a really great dad. My dad and I are really close. So I think that that was just like, oh, well, I have a dad with my dad. He's a great dad. So I never really felt like even though it might be easier to find my father here in the States, I always thought about going to find my mother. I've long since, since I have my own child, it's not as important anymore to me, but there was a time in my life where it felt like because my sisters um, are spitting images of my mom and like you can, at, as they got older, you couldn't tell them apart. Like they're that close together. That, that I think really, because I was so different, it really pulled on my heartstrings to know like, well, who am I like? Like what part of me did I get? So I think that that longing of belonging um, and recognizing our own heritage um, and our ancestry is a piece of it. So I was always really, like I said, a proponent for like, just, just get as much information that you're comfortable with, but that kind of covers those basic things that you take for granted that you know about yourself. Like, oh, you know, Uncle Tommy used to be a baseball player. Look at, you're so good at baseball. Like those little things that feel like they don't matter those are the weird little things that mattered. Like, um, because in comparison, I didn't have them with my family. Mm. Right. So I think that that's that to me, when I grew up, that was my, I don't call it a regret, but it was my, um, it was my angst that kind of wore on me for a long time was not feeling like I knew where I came from. Mm. And that piece, um, Thankfully, because of my own son now, I think I, I landed in a place where I belong. Like, mm -hmm. I belong to him and he belongs to me. Mm -hmm. But it also then shines a light on how adopted children can feel like they don't belong to anyone. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got really choked up for a moment there when um, you were sharing. It just, there, was a, there was a point in there. And I just got really prepped to just the pain of that, how we're all wanting to have the sense of belonging. And, you know, it's just so, um, such a huge part of me in creating community, right? And creating sisterhood is having people have a sense of belonging. And so I'm just, like, I got really present to just your courage and your resilience and just, um, you know, you had these two pieces, the adoption and then having the psychic ability or the oracle and you navigating and turning this, what could have been very, you know, just perceived pain that some people just suffer for throughout their whole life. Like you've turned it into purpose and there's just an embodiment that you, um, you know, you, you just come into this level of embodiment, um, in bringing and weaving these pieces together to um bring your work oh so yeah i just wanted to acknowledge that thank and you i, I appreciate that, that. Yeah. yeah yeah well you know it's it has been a long road and mm -hmm. um but i think it speaks to my my desire to to do my work because i just know that for me, once I learned what my purpose was and I saw the connection to something so much bigger, um, I call myself a humanist. Like I just love people. I love them because I see the divine in them all the time yeah. and I just want to help them see it in themselves. Yeah. Mm. Wow. This has just been such a powerful interview. Um, thank you so much for just your just being open and, and sharing so much of who you are. And um, so if women are interested in learning more about you, uh, do you have um, like perhaps a free gift for people to go check out or? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you go to my site, oracleonpurpose.com, on the very front page, you can click on um, a little bit of a free gift that I have in the center of the page that will actually help you figure out what your unique life purposes. It actually gives you some tools to kind of look at your goals and what you're doing from the fundamentals of who you are and how you can actually use that as an aligning tool. So mm, um, awesome. yeah, absolutely. I'd love to share that. And if anybody here um, reaches out to me in my contact form and says they're from um, your group, then I will offer a free consult as well to kind of tap in. If they're feeling like something I've said today has touched them, I would love to speak to them more about that.
Great. Yeah. So just me mention Sistership Circle or yeah. Tanya and, um, and you could get a free consult. Right. Um, thank you for that. So in conclusion, just to wrap this up, um, if I were to give you the megaphone for all the women and shouting from the rooftops, what is the last thing that you want to leave everyone with today? Mm. Please know that whatever you are, whatever you have to offer, there is someone out there who's seeking it because you are here on purpose and life has never made a mistake. You are exactly who you are with what you are for a reason and the universe is waiting for you to show up and shine. Mm, thank you. That thank is you. so powerful. Thank you everyone for tuning in and we will catch you next time on the next Sistership Circle podcast.